tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. Socorro, New Mexico, 1964. It began as a routine police pursuit, just a wild teenager tooling through town, and ended with one of the most remarkable UFO episodes in history, a close encounter still impossible to ignore. Welcome to Valley Hill, Kentucky, where thousands of people, from these teenage girls to skeptical adults, say they have witnessed miraculous visions. A case of mass hallucination? Or is Valley Hill truly touched by God? In Dallas, Texas, an attorney named David Merrifield schedules a pre-breakfast meeting with a mysterious new client. An hour later, two women make the horrifying discovery. Who murdered David Merrifield? And you'll see how your calls reunited a family with the guardian angels who rescued them after a terrifying accident. Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. April 24, 1964, the little town of Socorro, New Mexico was quiet. Police officer Lonnie Zamora was not surprised. During the five years he'd been on the force, Socorro had almost always been quiet. When Lonnie spotted local teenagers speeding through town, he figured riding him up might be the biggest excitement of the day. The chase proceeded to the edge of town and beyond, out into the desert. Lonnie Zamora had no warning. He was about to leave his safe, secure world and enter the realm of the unexplained. Roswell, Gulf Breeze, Area 51. To anyone with even a passing knowledge of UFO history, these names instantly conjure images of bizarre lights, spaceships, and strange visitors from another world. On that day in 1964, Lonnie Zamora had no idea that Socorro was about to become another landmark, the location of what some believe is one of the most significant UFO sightings ever made. Lonnie had no idea what was waiting for him just down the road. Socorro, to Socorro. Socorro, go ahead. Well, going up to half ways, I could see a white object to my left there. I thought it was a turnover car. When I got up on top of the mesa there, I looked down, and I seen this uh, big white object uh, on the ground. I could see something around the craft there. I could see some figures. It looked like they were walking around the craft. Socorro two, Socorro. According to Lonnie, he saw red markings on the hull a vertical arrow with a horizontal line beneath it and a crescent-shaped line above it. 
Lonnie made several attempts to contact police headquarters. He was never able to break through the heavy static. After he heard two metallic sounds like doors clanging shut, he realized the small figures had vanished. So this flame come up from underneath it, and it ran back behind the car. And it went up to 20, 30 feet up in the air. So he just stayed there for a while, and then finally just took off slowly to the west. At first, you know, after I got to my senses, I said, did I see it or didn't I, you know? Or what happened, you know? And uh, that's it. Lonnie radioed to an old friend, Sergeant Sam Chavez of the New Mexico State Police. He told Sam to come fast and to come alone. ¿Qué estás haciendo, hombre? Are you okay? What happened out here? I saw it. I saw, Mira, I saw, I saw it, amigo. Mira, I saw, I saw. I could tell that Lonnie was excited and probably scared. What happened from the start? I lost my glasses. That's what There they are. I'll, I'll get them for you, OK? Relax. Take a deep breath. Lonnie Samora, he's a very dependable, honest type of person. He's not one to create or make stories or, or or build things up to, to make it exciting, anything like that. He, he's, a, he's a very well-liked type of a person. I saw two of them. Two of them what? People, the, the little ones, they were in, a, in the uniforms, white. Let's go take a look, huh? No, 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 I'm not going down there. Come on, come on, you don't have to be afraid of anything. Come on, Lonnie, let's wait, no, go. Wait, no, I'll be, I'll be right behind you. All right, uh, come, come on, on. let's go. What the hell is this? We found uh, some uh, indentation on the ground where this thing had landed, and the, the marks into the ground were nine inches deep, eight inches long, and nine inches wide. That's where the blast took off. It blocked me right over the car. I started looking for tracks, human tracks, but the only thing I found was uh, impressions on the ground that were made by a perfect circle, but I found no human tracks, no shoe prints. Within 90 minutes, U.S. Army officials at nearby White Sands Missile Range sent Captain Richard T. Holder to investigate. This is the first time Holder has ever talked publicly about what he saw. Well, my first impression was that it was something from the range that needed possible help, you know, first aid, attention, or at best security. The more I got into it, the less convinced I was that that was the case. Holder also noticed the unusual impressions left in the sand. On the edge of the landing area, he found a bush burned to a crisp on only one side, as though seared by a blowtorch. Gentlemen, this area is now officially designated sensitive. This entire area needs to be quadrant. Yes, sir. Folks, Thank if you. you just move right on back. Officers, if you'd please take charge of these folks. We're gonna need to secure this gentleman with a camera. State Trooper Ted Jordan was taking pictures. His camera and film were confiscated on the spot. I do recall that they told me that they would uh, develop them and send me copies of them. And it never occurred. And when I asked later about it, they told me that the film was no good. Uh, it had been ruined by radiation. Gentlemen, what we're looking for is anything metallic. Metallic could be shiny, could be dulled object. We'll do a magnetic scan later. We looked around to try to find out if we could see any evidence of anything that would make us think it was a hoax. We found nothing. Everything we saw seemed to support the story that Officer Zamora recounted. 
My impression of talking to him was that he was mystified. He wanted an explanation. Nothing that I heard of later gave me the slightest hint that he did this as a hoax or cooked it up for fame or fortune. Whatever Lonnie saw, he apparently was not the only one. Just a few minutes after Lonnie drove into the Arroyo, a motorist who has never been identified pulled into a gas station on the north side of Socorro. Okay, I guess. I'll tell you, your aircraft sure fly low around here. How's that? We were south of town, headed north. Something flew right across the hood of the car, doing about 150 miles an it hour. almost hit our car. A white oval-shaped object scared yeah. us to death. Jimmy Grinder was only 13, but he remembers the incident vividly. Did you folks call the police? No, there was a cop who looked like he was chasing it, going the same way the yeah, craft was, was headed way. west, with yeah. his lights on, his siren and everything. I believe I Lonnie was... saw something, same as the tourists saw, something that they have never seen or encountered before. You know, it did not meet a helicopter type scenario, definitely wasn't an airplane type scenario. And so you drool those two things out in 1964, what do you have? It definitely wasn't a weather balloon. By the next morning, newspapers and wire services all over the country had picked up the story. Around Socorro, rumors ran rampant. Wild stories of flying saucers and funny little people. Everyone wanted details. They stopped me all over town and wanted to know this, wanted to know that. And then I got phone calls from all over the world. And I, I, I was getting, you know, disgusted with it. The Air Force followed up the Army investigation with its own team. After a cursory once-over, the Air Force agreed that Lonnie saw something. They insisted, however, that it must have been a secret military test device. Are you getting anything? Of course not. Here. They never were able to find any such evidence that any such thing was being tested at the time. And in fact, even today, not an iota of evidence has emerged to support that claim. Nonetheless, the Air Force line on the case is that this is a credible witness. He clearly saw some kind of structured flying vehicle and that it must have been something that we built even if we can't find it anywhere. While the military investigated, the UFO fever continued unabated. Since the 1950s, the Air Force had been criticized by Congress for its handling of UFO reports. The Socorro sighting threatened to add more pressure. Finally, Air Force officials summoned Dr. J. Allen Hynek, a respected astronomer. Dr. Hynek was the most prestigious consultant on Project Blue Book, the official Air Force study of the UFO phenomenon. Dr. Hynek went to Socorro. He talked to Lani, studied the landing site, and examined the photographs. He found the physical evidence extremely compelling, but the most persuasive argument for a genuine UFO sighting was Lonnie Zamora himself. Uh, 158.5. Okay. Okay, Lonnie, now these depressions, you said, were actually from the outriggers. They held up the craft. Dr. Hynek was enormously impressed by Lonnie Zamora. He thought there was virtually no possibility of a hoax. And on May 20th, he wrote a private memorandum, which he kept in his files, and which I discovered years after his death, in which he expressed huge disdain for the Blue Book handling of the report. And he said that it was clear that the story that Blue Book had cooked up about this possibly being some kind of experimental aircraft was a story that even Blue Book knew to be untrue, but which was invented to keep Congress from harassing the Air Force. Today, some 30 years later, the question remains, how do we explain what Lonnie Zamora saw? No matter what others believe, Lonnie has no doubt that what he witnessed was not of this earth. I still think it's something not from here. If I could find out what it actually was, okay, I'm satisfied. I just didn't want to go through it again, you know. If they want to believe me, good. If they don't want to believe me, it's all right, too. I believe Lonnie Zamora was a good policeman 
and an honest man who reported as he thought proper something well beyond his experience. Was it something terrestrial, uh, extraterrestrial? I have no idea. Coming up, a grateful family is reunited with the unknown Good Samaritans who saved their lives. Recently, your phone calls brought about one of our most unusual and gratifying reunions ever. The people involved were not related, had never been formally introduced, and in fact, only learned each other's names on the night of our broadcast. It began in December 1983. The Dover family of Atlanta, Georgia was traveling to Mexico to celebrate the holidays with relatives. On the second day out, just after crossing the border, the weather suddenly changed, and the Dovers found themselves caught in a freak snowstorm. We were trying to be extremely cautious because the road conditions were really getting pretty bad. And my father had just told me to, to even be extremely careful. And just moments after he had told me that, I suddenly lost control. Tragically, all four people in the other car were killed. But miraculously, the six members of the Dover party were still alive, if only barely. By some incredible stroke of fortune, an American couple, one of whom was a doctor, happened upon the crash scene. Thanks largely to their efforts, the Dovers were pulled from the wreckage and received urgent medical care. Linda Dover credits the two good Samaritans with saving the lives of her entire family. Okay. How you doing? Hang on there. I feel like it was a miracle. Uh, many times it's an accident, and you know, we just drive by an accident. But, uh, and they could have done that that day, but they didn't. They stopped. And through their stopping, they saved the lives of our family. And we just want to say thank you. On the night we aired this story, the Dovers waited nervously back in Georgia to hear whether the case would be solved. Let's go to Keely Shea Smith for more. Bob, one of our viewers in Houston, Texas, saw the story and realized that she heard that very same story from her friends, Dr. Nancy Neff Hannon and her husband, John. Later that night, the Hannons called us here at our phone center and provided agents with a detailed description of the rescue. It was clear from the start that the Hannons were, in fact, the Dovers' guardian angels. Later that evening, the Hannons spoke to Vance Dover, who immediately passed on the exciting news to the rest of his family. Vance said, well, we found them. <laughs> that was it. We found them. They've called. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, you could hear a pin drop on the floor. It's like, you know, um, we couldn't believe it. After 11 years, we, we found that these angels were real human beings, you know. A few weeks later, some 30 members of the Dover family gathered to meet the Hannons and compare memories of that fateful Christmas Eve. There, there was a lady in the front seat, uh, which had turned sideways. So I had to lift her up, because uh, the front seat had broken off its pedestal, sort of supported that, kind of wedged myself in there, supported that with my shoulder as I tried to get him, get David out. I remember the pain of somebody pulling me out. Because mm -hmm. I guess that maybe is where I, I woke up or whatever. But this, uh, and my leg hurt really bad. Mm -hmm. I, I guess as a physician, that was one of the most helpless feelings I've ever had. I mean, to have the knowledge and everything, but not the tools to do anything. It, it was just really frustrating. I mean, to us, you were like an angel from God, both of you, that you were right there at the time, and, and had you not been there at all, the whole family, uh, you know, could have possibly died, and you were so instrumental, and so we just wanted to say thank you. For the Dovers, the gathering was a chance to finally close this dramatic chapter of their lives. Thanks, Keely. 
Every Christmas from now on, when the Dovers make their annual pilgrimage to Mexico, they plan to stop in Houston to visit with their new lifelong friends, their guardian angels, the Hannons. When we return, incredible claims of miraculous visions on a hillside in Kentucky, hundreds of pilgrims believe. Do you? In the Past Unsolved Mysteries has taken you around the world to visit sacred locales, said to have been graced with miraculous visions of the Virgin Mary. Lourdes, France, Fatima, Portugal, Medjugorje, and what is now Bosnia. Tonight we feature what may be another such holy spot much closer to home. Twice a month, on the 2nd and 23rd, people flock to a small hillside in Kentucky where visions of the Blessed Mother have been reported. We asked newscaster Jackie Hayes from our NBC affiliate WAVE-TV in Louisville to investigate this phenomenon. This is Springfield, Kentucky, Route 55, about an hour's drive southwest of Louisville. A sign proudly proclaims that the site is now dedicated to Our Lady of Valley Hill. During the past year, thousands of people, from teenagers to senior citizens, have crossed this creek bed and headed up Valley Hill. Some of them have come here hoping to be healed of serious illnesses, and others have sought spiritual healing. All of them have come here hoping to witness a miracle. To date, no fewer than 1,000 people claim to have had visions, from random bursts of color to showers of golden flakes. The visions first appeared to this woman, Iona Wright, who owns the land on which Valley Hill is located. I've been seeing these visions for years and years, a long time. Just seem, just seem as if I was looking at a movie. On the day we filmed at Valley Hill, I was one of 300 visitors. I saw nothing unusual. However, at least a third of those present, 100 people, claim that they indeed had visions inspired by God. Look up in the clouds. It looks like mud. Oh, gosh, it's getting deeper. It looks like mud. Okay. I mean, look how bright the sun is. I can't see it. I can't tell if it's Jesus or Mary. I don't see the sun. Uh huh, in the sun. Uh, see, there's like a little rosary right there, and, then and there's, there's a, a door. gateway to heaven. There is gold on the on the old man down there. The man looking up at the sun, his whole face is gold. But you don't see it, do you? <laughs> now, had you been looking at the sun? Not, at, not before. Because we thought that might be what was causing it. I said, you know, when you look at the sun long enough, it plays tricks on your eyes. But what we saw is away from the sun. And I would never look at the sun. <laughs> but it, it started just pulsating, turning colors and everything. And then after a while, you see colors around, different colors, primarily red. And uh, they would kind of move. Many of the eyewitnesses say that the visions have had a profound effect upon their lives. Perhaps the most dramatic episode involved a Sunday school teacher and eight young girls who came to Valley Hill on April 6, 1995. The first girl to notice something unusual was Mandy Mattingly. I said, look, y'all, the sun, it's moving. And it had like a little disc around it, like rings. We looked at the sun, there's like three rings around the sun. It's like shaking, spinning. And spinning. And just like the outer part would change colors and the inner would change. It was just different colors at times. I was like freaking out. I was like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Why is this happening to us? I turned around to take a picture. Right. of the sun because the girl said, look at the sun, the sun is pulsating, and I took my Polaroid and took pictures. Did and you see the sun pulsating? Oh, yes, yes, I saw it too. And then when I turned around, well, everybody was saying, oh, look at the gold, look at the gold on you, look at here. I was like, oh my gosh, look at me. It's like sparks of gold all over me. And then she snapped a picture and I was like, like that, and then, I looked at the picture and there was like angels on each side of me, like the angels' wings. She took another picture of the sun, it's like come out, it was like real dark, and then there was like eyes, you can see eyes of Jesus, and he had like his little crowns above him, and then like beside it was like Mary. According to the girls, the Virgin Mary appears on the left wearing a veil. They believe that the blurred image on the right is Jesus. Another Polaroid was perhaps more unusual. 
And one of them, it had a tombstone, it looked like, and it had my cousin's name on it, Kate Ballard, when she, she died when she was born. And I, we haven't found any explanation for it, but I think it was her name. They were hugging each other. They were hugging me. There were tears. They were crying. Um, to see that experience, I knew that these girls were deeply affected. It was a profound experience. I think they were most amazed. We asked paranormal investigator Joe Nickel to comment on the photographs. These angel wings or flame effects are due to light leakage into the cartridge. When you put the cartridge into the camera, if your thumb cracks that open just a little bit and lets light leak in. Now, what about this picture? We don't have angel wings, but we have some shape of a form at the bottom. The girls say they see the Virgin Mary and Jesus. It's possible to see faces and pictures in the clouds. It's a well-known phenomenon. The, 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 human, uh, the human mind wants to uh, make pictures out of uh, random patterns, and so we, can, we see uh, pictures all the time. What would it But in us? fact, well, again, this cartridge has been mishandled. And this, this part of the film you can actually see is not in focus. You can see it's blurred. Tell me about this uh, last picture. Okay. There seem to be words here. A couple <clears throat> of the girls were saying it, it rang a bell, that there was a family member's name in that picture, and maybe this was a sign. What do you see? Right. Uh, when we put a film pack in, it automatically whirs and ejects this card, which is meant to keep the light away from the picture. And when I turned it over, I really had to laugh because here is the chart with the wording on it, only it's backwards. And so the light has gone in there and bounced off of that white card and left a reverse imprint as a, as a sort of technically a double exposure. Rational explanations may satisfy some people, but not the mothers of two of the girls who came to Valley Hill to see for themselves. I was skeptical at, at first. I, I thought, you know, maybe, maybe this did happen, but I was kind of scared. And then about that time, I started looking at the tree with a, a, where it shows how to say the rosary. Which tree? Where is that? It's right over in behind the grotto. Okay. And I looked behind there, and then I started seeing the spots. They were just, they kept flickering like they were flickering on that one place. I yelled out at Trees. Trees, my God, you've got gold all over you. It was like uh, gold dust, just, you would sit on her feet, and then it's like it was just going up her body, and then just leave, and then here would come more up her body and leave. Had you been looking at the sun for a long time? No, I never even looked at the sun. I thought if you look at the sun long enough, it could, you know, do something to your eyes. So you did not look I at the did sun? I not look at the sun. But you saw? I saw the gold spots. How does that make you feel when others are really seeing it? Is that sort of confirmed to you all that what you saw was real? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was real. Well, we knew it was real. Yeah, we knew it was real. Whether or not anybody else sees it. Yes. Yeah. 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 We've seen it, and that's all that counts. Is Valley Hill a sacred spot, destined to join Lourdes and Fatima as a holy shrine? Only time will tell. But for now, there is no denying that this remote Kentucky hillside has become a house of worship, a church in the woods for the faithful. Are the miraculous visions in Kentucky real? Those who've experienced the sightings are convinced of their authenticity. However, it is interesting to note that the local Catholic Church has declined to recognize Valley Hill as anything out of the ordinary. The rest of us will have to decide for ourselves. Next, when a loving family is split apart, a young girl embarks on a 20-year search. For orphaned or abandoned children, foster homes are often a temporary salvation. Sometimes, unfortunately, they turn out to be impersonal places that only a bureaucrat could call home. To the four children in our next story, however, a foster home became the first chance to be part of a real family. Hi, hello. Hi, I'm Mark. Hello, Mark. How are you? In December 1968, Dorothy and Robert Reese of Napa, California, welcomed two five-year-olds into their home as foster children. Oh, you're so beautiful. Yes. Mark and Tammy Gardner were fraternal twins who'd been severely abused emotionally and physically. Both were developmentally disabled. Tammy had trouble walking and talking normally. Debbie, honey? For the Reese's five-year-old daughter, Deborah, none of that mattered. 
She had a new brother and sister. Tammy, I like your dog. When they came to us, I remember feeling wonderful that there was someone my age. I can finally have someone to, that I can relate to. Sure. There were people, two little people like me, and I thought it was fabulous. You will find, Tammy and Mark, that mom makes the best fried chicken you've ever had. Isn't Tammy like was very, very scared, had a very frightful look, and Mark was the total opposite. In fact, he spoke for Tammy every time my parents would ask her a question. She would like some. Now, Tammy, if you want some butter for your corn, you're going to have to ask for it. So would you like some butter for your corn? Is that the best you can do? <laughs> All right, then. Here, let me get in the supportive atmosphere of the Reese home, Tammy and Mark began to heal. A year later, the family grew to include two more foster children, six-year-old Kelly Clay and his four-year-old sister, Terry. Before long, it seemed as if none of them had ever known another home. Theirs was a kinship far beyond blood. We were our best friends. Most of the time, it was the five of us kids swimming or the five of us kids picking apples or the five of us kids getting into trouble. Because of the abuse Tammy and Mark had experienced, they were placed in special education classes. That made them a frequent target for cruel teasing. As the oldest, Deborah was a natural leader. You push my little sister. Yeah. At school, she often confronted the bullies who tormented Mark and Tammy. I Tammy, I think, thrived on the fact that she had brothers and sisters that would really stick up for her no matter what, accepted her for who she was. Kids, could you come in for a second? We just need to talk for a couple minutes. By 1974, the Reese clan had been together for six years. Dorothy and Robert planned to adopt all four foster children. Then the Reese's got into a nasty dispute with the adoption agency. As a result, the children would have to leave. To ease the blow, Robert Reese blamed the bad news on his heart condition. That your mom would be all alone. And so uh, the folks from Child Protective Services are going to, uh, are going to have to, sp to sp split us up. Where are we going to go? They, they will probably put you with another foster family. We're family, and we have to stay together. That's right. Sweetheart. I just figured they'd never leave. They're my brothers and sisters forever. Are we ever going to see you again? A few weeks later, the reality hit when they weren't around. There's a big empty house, and there wasn't Mark and Kelly talking and my mom saying, quiet boys, go to sleep. And there wasn't me yakking with Tammy and Terry, and it was just silence. A year passed. Deborah didn't see her foster sisters or brothers at all. She began to think she would never see them again. Then out of the blue, Mark surprised Deborah at the stable where she boarded her horse. Seeing him, we were overwhelmed with each other. We cried. But what he had to tell me hurt terribly. Our foster parents, they hit us a lot. A shaken mark made some disturbing allegations. He's hurt more than me. My mother and father did try to find out what was going on, but they ran into people who told them, never mind, it's none of your business, they're not your children. That day in 1975 was the last time Deborah saw Mark. Bye, Mark. Ever since, her heart has ached for the loss of Mark, Tammy, Kelly, and Terry. I felt like someone came in the middle of the night and stole them out of my room. My four best friends, they stole out of my room. And they and I don't know what happened to him. As soon as she was old enough, Deborah started searching. 20 years went by, but she never gave up. Finally, 
Just last September, she walked into the open arms of Terry and Kelly Clay. Reunited at last. But Deborah's quest is not over. Unfortunately, she has yet to find any trace of Tammy or Mark. When we return, in Dallas, a respected attorney is gunned down in his office building. <laughs> Dallas, Texas, Thursday, February 9th, 1995. At 7 a.m., attorney Clint Blackman arrived at his office building. He bypassed the notoriously slow elevator and took the stairs to the third floor. At 7.30 a.m., Juanita Lackey arrived. Roxanne Lederman, a secretary, let Juanita into the building. Oh, I'm sorry I had to get you there. That's OK. I you were her early. No, no, I've got a lot of work to do. Oh, thanks. Don't no. worry about it. <laughs> keys. Roxanne and Juanita were about to receive the shock of their lives. Presentation, you know. Oh, that's oh, right. right. I forgot about that. Are you ready? Well, yeah. I heard a lot of screaming and hollering. It was Roxanne and Juanita. Juanita said that she thought that there was a man in the elevator, but all they'd really seen was legs and, and weren't really sure what was there. So I told her, OK, I will go down and, and check this out. David Merrifield. Oh, no, it couldn't be. David Merrifield was one of Clint Blackman's colleagues in the law firm of Smith, Merrifield, and Richards. He had been shot in the back of the head, execution style. He left behind two children and a new bride of only three months. The murder of David Merrifield is a kind of bizarre case that every cop dreads. There was no obvious motive. A 42-year-old attorney specialized in real estate law. Over the years, he had built a profitable but prosaic practice. His clients were not at all the criminal type. David Merrifield seemed to be the last person anyone would want to murder. Ladies, what time did you get to work? Well, I got here about... The most likely scenario was robbery, but Dallas police quickly ruled that out. No, no. Mr. Merrifield's wallet was recovered a few miles from the crime location. And uh, in the wallet was still a small amount of money and all of his credit cards. So I believe had robbery been a motive, that stuff would not have uh, been recovered. Police next turned their attention to David Merrifield himself, piecing together the details of his last hours. The day before he was murdered, David received four phone calls from a mysterious stranger who identified himself as Sam Jones. That's what this is regarding. He's on the other line right now. Can I take a message? He asked if he could hold on. He told me his name was Sam Jones, but he wouldn't tell me who he was with or what it was concerning. And so I took that to be kind of a solicitation type call because that's usually what solicitors would say. Hi, David. I have a Mr. Sam Jones on the other line. He's very insistent. He wants to talk to you right now. All right, put him through. This is David. Hi, Mr. Jones. David spoke to him for, I guess, a little under 10 minutes. I went up and kind of joked with David, and I said, well, what's he trying to sell you? And David says, well, he's not trying to sell me anything yet. Uh, he says he says he wants to do something for me. David Merrifield, we discovered during the investigation, had a notepad on his desk, which had a calendar on it. And on February the 9th, he had a, a marking there for a name and, a, and an appointment that he had at 6.30 AM with Sam Jones. Due to the common nature of the name, it's my guess it's possibly a fictitious name. Is that Police also keyed in on the unusual hour set for the appointment. By all accounts, David would never have suggested such an early meeting. Yeah, I had known David and worked with him for years and know David's habit, and that was he never liked to get to work early. 
In fact, uh, to see him at work before nine was just unusual. He was he was not an early riser. He used like to work later. For him to make a meeting that early in the morning, I mean, he would do it for someone if someone really needed it. Um, I've since heard that apparently the guy told him he was leaving on a flight and absolutely had to see him. Um, David would do it in a case like that if it was something he felt was really important. So, um, but otherwise, it was not like David to be anywhere at 6.30 in the morning except asleep. Police theorize that the killer insisted on an early meeting in order to get David alone. Finally met you. Let's come on up to the office. Was your flight okay? That's good. Get a cup of coffee and we'll go over the papers. Um, we think that Mr. Merrifield he entered the elevator with another person. See if they meet Whoever Sam Jones is, it's obvious from our investigation, lured him to this location to, to do exactly what he did, to take his life on the elevator that morning. No one ever heard from this man again, the Sam Jones. Um, we all kind of felt like if, if the man had really come to try to meet David, then he would have probably found him, would have called later to say, we, I wasn't able to get in the building and Mr. Merrifield never showed up. I mean, this man just disappeared. What we need in this case is a, an independent witness to come forward. If that person has heard any, any person boasting about being involved in this crime, if that person happened to be in, in this lo at this location or near this location on the morning of the crime and might have seen suspicious activity, that's the type of information we need. We need to know who Sam Jones is. I think the thing that's most disturbing to me is the loss of David Merrifield. He was a very fine attorney, and everyone here liked and, and enjoyed working with him, so that's probably the most upsetting thing. It's also very upsetting that there is a criminal out there hey, Mr. Jones. who knows he's out there, he or she, and knows that they committed this crime okay. and has not been brought to justice. Join me next time for another fascinating edition of Unsolved Mysteries.